All right, what we're going to look at in this vodcast is the Bohr model of the atom. So let's review, first of all, the Thomson model and the Rutherford model. The Thomson model of the atom put the atom as an area that contained positive and negative values throughout the atom. But there, weren't really, there wasn't really any structure of these positives and negatives. The Rutherford model of the atom put the nucleus at the center and then had the electrons outside the nucleus, assuming moving around the nucleus in some manner. Well, there were problems with both of these models, and Bohr came along and attempted to solve those problems. Now, what he did was he had the nucleus at the center, but those electrons he put into energy levels, and those electrons were confined to those energy levels. So if you had an electron in the first energy level, it would move around the nucleus inside that energy level. So let's take a look at those energy levels and point out some significant components of, of the levels. Okay, looking at the energy rings, there's a couple of things we want to point out that are important. So we've got the nucleus at the center, and around the nucleus we've got the different rings. We're going to refer to the rings as energy. So when we say energy level 1, we mean n is equal to 1. When we say n is equal to 2, we mean energy level 2, etc. So the electrons are going to sit inside these rings, and there's, a, and there's a specific number of electrons per ring, and we'll get to that part. Um, we learned in class that if you put energy into this atom, in other words, let's say we put a little bit of a fire underneath the atom and we put some energy into it, what's going to happen is these electrons are going to jump to higher energy levels. They might jump from the first to the second, they could jump from the first to the third, etc. Well, what Bohr did was he looked at the hydrogen atom and he came up with a model of how the atom works. Now, unfortunately, Bohr's model only works for the hydrogen atom, and we'll address that in a, in a later vodcast. So anyway, the difference, the important part about the Bohr model of the atom is the difference in energy from one level to the next. So if you're going to promote an electron from the first energy level to the second energy level, we say that it needs one quantum of energy, and that energy is specific. So if you put not quite enough energy into the electron and it doesn't have enough to go to the next level, that electron won't make it to the next level. On the other hand, if you put a little bit too much energy, that electron is still going to set at the next level. In other words, you have to have a specific amount of energy. The other important thing about the energy levels is that as you move away from the nucleus, the jump from level to level becomes smaller. So the jump to go from energy level 1 to energy level 2 will require a certain amount of energy, but then the jump from 2 to 3 will, will require a little bit less energy. The jump from 3 to 4 would be less, etc., etc. So as you move away from the nucleus, those individual jumps become smaller and smaller. However, the overall energy becomes greater and greater. And you can kind of think about it as if you were climbing a ladder uh, to get up to the second floor of your house, but the rungs of the ladder got closer and closer as you got higher and higher. Even though the rungs of the ladder are becoming closer and it's easier to make the steps, the overall energy that you're developing as you move away from the ground is getting greater and greater. So certainly if you fell from up here, you would have much more energy than if you fell from up here. To talk about the other aspects of the Bohr model that are important, we have to understand a few things about light and the electromagnetic spectrum. So what we're going to do is just do a little bit of review of the electromagnetic spectrum. First of all, you need to know that light travels in waves, and those waves have some characteristics. In other words, if we look at this end of the spectrum, and we went from crest to crest, we refer to that as the wavelength, and it gets the symbol lambda. If, we're, if we were to measure how many of these crests past a certain point every second, we would measure what we refer to as its frequency. So, so far we've got the wavelength of light and we've got the frequency of light. And again, the wavelength is simply the distance from crest to crest or trough to trough, and the frequency would be if you could measure how many of these crests 
past a certain point as the wave was moving. So if light has a different wavelength, we give it a different name. In other words, down here, where light has a very short wavelength, we call those gamma rays. Up here, where it has a very long wavelength, we refer to those as uh, uh, radio waves. Now what our eyes see are the visible region. In other words, this very small region of the spectrum right here, it's expanded for easy viewing, is where we get the colors Roy G Viv. In other words, red light, whoops, in other words, red light has a specific wavelength. Green light has a specific wavelength. Violet light has a specific wavelength. Well, the wavelength and the frequency are connected through two equations. And what we're also going to talk about is the energy of these wavelengths of light. So we've got three variables. Lambda, which stands for wavelength, frequency, which or nu, which stands for frequency, and E, which stands for energy. So let's see what we can do with these three equations, or three variables. So we can connect these three variables with three equations. We have E is equal to H times nu. My equals doesn't want to work there. We have lambda is equal to C over frequency. And then we have nu is equal to C over lambda. A couple things we want to point out here. The value H is referred to as Planck's constant, and its value is 6.63 times 10 to the negative 34th, and the unit is joules times seconds. Don't worry about what that means at this point, just realize that the unit is joules times seconds. The other constant that we have here is C, and it represents the speed of light. And its value is, is 3 times 10 to the 8th, 3 times 10 to the 8th meters per second. E stands for energy, and its units are joules. And again, we said lambda stands for wavelength. Its units are meters. And we have frequency, and its units are inverse seconds. So what we can do is, so what we can do is connect these three equations by calculating one of the three variables. In other words, let's just say, for example, you are given a wavelength is equal to 3 times 10 to the uh, negative 7th meters. We can calculate the frequency by finding C over lambda. In other words, we would take uh, nu is equal to 3 times 10 to the 8th meters per second, our constant for the speed of light, and our value 3 times 10 to the negative 7th as our wavelength. If we put that into our calculators, we get uh, 1. We get 1 times 10 to the 15th. And again, it's frequency, so the unit is inverse seconds. Now that we know our frequency, what we can do is put that into E is equal to H times nu. So in other words, we're going to take that value and put it there. So energy is equal to H, which is 6.63 times 10 to the negative 34th joules times seconds times our frequency of 1 times, whoops, 1, 1 times 10 to the 15th inverse seconds. When we do that, we will get we get 6.63 times 10 to the negative 19th joules. Now that's a pretty quick and sloppy way of going through these calculations, but the important part is realizing that if we look at the three equations, lambda is equal to c over nu, nu is equal to c over lambda, and then energy is equal to h times nu, we can solve any of the problems involving energy, frequency, and light. We'll address in the next vodcast what, how we apply this to the Bohr model of the atom.